Chapter 29 The Birth, Rise and Fall of Junitaki Township It was an early morning train we took from Sapporo to Asahikawa. I opened a beer as I settled down to the voluminous, silk-cased, authoritative history of Junitaki Township. Junitaki was the township in which the ship professor's homestead was located. Reading up on its history probably had no practical value, but it couldn't hurt. The author was born in 1940 in Junitaki and after graduating from the literature department of Hokkaido University was active as a local historian or so the cover copy said for being so active he had only one book to his name published in May 1970 first edition probably the only edition according to the author the first settlers arrived in what today is Junitaki early in the summer of 1881 18 persons total all poor dot farmers from Tsugaru meager farm tools clothes bedding cook pots and knives being the sum of their possessions they passed through an ainu village near sapporo with the little money they had they engaged a lean dark eyed ainu youth as a guide the youth's name in ainu translated into full moon on the wane suggesting a tendency toward manic depression the author hypothesized Perhaps the youth was not cut out to be a guide still he proved far better than he might have at first appeared hardly understanding any japanese he led these eighteen grim suspicious farmers north up along the ishikari river he had a clean picture in mind where to go to find fertile land on the fourth day the entourage arrived at this destination endowed with vast waters the whole landscape was alive with beautiful flowers here is good said the youth few wild animals fertile soil plenty of salmon nothing doing said the leader of the farmers we want further in the youth understood the farmers to believe they'd find better land the farther in they went fine if that's what they want off into the interior so the entourage continued their march north for another two days there the youth found a rise where if the soil was not exactly as rich as the earlier spot at least there was no fear of flooding How about it asked the youth here is also good the farmers shook their heads this scene repeated itself any number of times until finally they arrived at the site of present day asahikawa 7 days and 100 miles from sapporo what about here asked the youth more uncertain than ever no go answered the farmers but from here we climb mountains said the youth we don't mind said the farmers gleefully and so they crossed the shiokari pass needless to say there was a reason why the farmers had passed up the rich bottom land and insisted on going deep into the wilderness the fact was they were on the lam they had skipped down walking out on sizable deaths and w- wanted to get as far away from civilization as possible of course the ainu youth had no way of knowing this and so naturally his initial surprise at the farmer's rejection of fertile farmland soon turned to bewilderment distress and loss of self confidence nevertheless the youth's character was sufficiently complex that by the time the ondor has crossed the shiokari pass he had given himself over to his incomprehensible fate leading them northward ever northward He took pains to choose the most rough trails, the most perilous bogs to please his patrons. Four days north of Shiokari Pass, the Ontoras came onto a west-flowing river. By consensus, it was decided they should head east. This tax sent them up horrible trails through horrible terrain. They fought through seas of brushed bamboo, hacked their way across the fields of shoulder-high grass a half day at a time, and waded through mud up to their chest, squirmed off crags, anything to get farther east at night they spread their tarps over the river bank and kept an ear out for the howling of wolves while they slept their arms scraped raw from the bush bamboo were beset at every turn by gnats and mosquitoes that would burrow into their ears to suck blood five days east they found their way blocked by the mountains and could go no further what lay beyond was not fit for human settlement the youth declared upon hearing this the farmer halted in their tracks This was July 8, 1881, miles overland from Sapporo. The first thing they surveyed the lay of the land, tested the water, checked the soil. It was reasonably good farmland. Then they divided the land among the group and erected a communal log cabin in the center. The Aini youth came upon the band of Aini hunters passing through the area. What is this area called? he asked them. 
Do you really think this asshole of a Terran even deserves a name? They replied. So for the time being, the frontier was without a name. As another dwelling, or at least another dwelling that desired human contact, did not exist for 40 miles, the settlement had no need for a name. In fact, when in 1889, an official consensus taker from the territorial government pressed the group for a name, the settlers remained steadfastly indifferent. Sickle and hoe in hand, they met in the communal heart and decided against naming the settlement. The official was literally up a creek. All he could do was to count the falls in nearby river, 12, and report the name of the Zunitaki Buraku or 12 Falls Settlement to the territorial government. From then on, the settlement bore the formal appellation Junitaki Buraku and later Junitaki Mura, 12 Falls Village. The area fanned a 60 degree arc between two mountains and was caught down the middle by a deep river gorge. An asshole of a terrain for sure, the ground was covered with brush bamboo with huge evergreens spread their roots far and wide. Wolves and elks and bears and muskrats and birds competed in wilderness for the meager food available. Everywhere, flies and mosquitoes swarmed. You all really want to live here? asked the Ainu youth. You bet, replied the farmers. It is not obvious why the Ainu youth, instead of returning to his own home, chose to stay on with the settlers. Perhaps he was curious, hypothesized the author, who loved to hypothesize. Whatever the case, if he had not remained, it's doubtful the settlers could have made it through the winter. The youth taught the settlers how to root for winter vegetables, how to survive the snow, how to fish in the frozen river, how to lay traps for the wolves, how to escape the attention of bears before hibernation, how to determine the weather from the direction of the wind, how to prevent chill blains, how to roast bush bamboo roots for food, how to fell evergreen trees in a set direction. Soon everyone came to recognize the youth's value, and the youth himself regained his confidence. He eventually took a Japanese name and married the daughter of one of the settlers, with whom he had three children. No more full moon on the wane. Yet, even with the practical knowledge of the Ainu youth, the settler's lot was miserable. By August, each family had built its own hut, which being a hurriedly thrown together affair of split logs, did next to nothing to keep out the winter wind. It was not uncommon to awaken and to find a foot of snow by one's pillow. Most families had but one set of bedding besides, so the men's folk typically had to sleep curled up by the fire. When their store of food was used up, the settlers went out in search of fish and whatever shriveled up wild plants they could find deep beneath the snow. It was an especially cold winter. No one died, however. There was no fighting, no tears. Their strength was their inbred poverty. Spring came, two children were born, and settlers' number rose to twenty-one. Two hours before giving birth, the mothers were working in the fields, and the morning after giving birth, they were working in the fields. The group planted corn and potatoes, the men felled trees, and burned the roots to clear more land. New life came over the face of the earth. Young plants bore fruit, and just when the settlers were sighting with relief, they were beset by swarm after swarm of locusts. The locusts swept in over the mountains. At first, they looked like a giant black cloud. Then there came a rumbling. No one had any idea what was about to overtake them. Only the Ainu youth knew. He ordered the men to build fires in the fields, dowsing their last piece of furniture in their last drop of oil. The men burned everything they could lay their hands on. The women folk banged pots with pestles. They did everything in their power, but everything was not enough. Hundreds of thousands of locusts swooped down into their crops and laid them to waste. Nothing was left in their wake. When the locusts departed, the youth went out into the fields and wept. Not one of the settlers shed a tear. They gathered up the dead locusts and burned them. And as soon as they were in ashes, the settlers continued to clear the land. They went back to eating fish and wild vegetables all through the next winter. In the spring, another three children were born. People planted the fields. In summer, they were visited by locusts again, and again all the crops were chewed down to the roots. This time, however, the Ainu youth did not weep. The onslaught of the locusts finally stopped the third year, and a long spell of rain had gotten to the locust eggs. But the excessive rain damaged the crops. The following year saw an unusual infestation of beetles, and the summer after that was unusually cold. Having read that far, I shot the book. I opened another beer and pulled a box lawns of salmon row out of my pack. She sat across from me with folded arms fast asleep. The autumn morning sun, slanting in through the train window, spread a thin blanket of light over her lap. 
A tiny moth blew in from somewhere and fluttered about like a scrap of paper. The moth ended up on her breast and stayed there before flying off again. Once the moth had flown off, she looked the slightest bit older. I smoked a cigarette, then resumed reading the authoritative history of Junitaki Township. By the sixth year, the settlement was at last holding its own. The crops were bearing, the cabins refurbished, and everyone had adjusted to life in the cold climate. Sod board houses took their place among the log cabins, hearths were built, lamps hung, people loaded up a boat with what little they had in the way of extra produce and dried fish and elk antlers, traveled two days to market in the nearest town and bought salt and clothing and oil in exchange. Some learned how to make charcoal from timber felled in the clearing fields. A number of similar settlements sprang up downstream and trade was established. A groundbreaking continued. It became apparent that the settlement was sorely short of hands, so the group convened the village council, who after two days decided to call in reinforcements from the old hometown. The question of renegade loans arose, but from replies to inquiries carefully crouched in their letters home, they learned that their creditors had long since given up on trying to collect. The eldest of the settlers, they sent off notes to their old buddies, asking that they join the settlers in working the new land. In 1889, the census was conducted, the same year the settlement was officially named. The following year, six new families, comprising 19 new settlers, came to the settlement. They were greeted with upgraded log cabins. A tearful reunion was had by all. The new residents were given land. With the help of the first settlers, they planted crops and built their own houses. By 1893, four more new villages had. By 1893, four more new families had arrived with 16 people. By 1897, seven more new families had arrived with 24 people. The number of settlers rose steadily. The communal hut was expanded into a formal meeting hall, and next to it, they built a small shrine. The settlement officially became a village. From Junitake Buraku to Junitake Mura, the postman began to make appearances, however infrequently. And while millet was the main diet of the villagers, they now occasionally mixed in real white rice. Of course, they were not without their share of misfortune. Officials came through to levy taxes and enforce military service. The Ainu youth, by now in his mid-thirties, was particularly upset by these developments. He could not understand why such things as taxes and military service were at all necessary. It seems to me things were better off like they used to be, he said. Even so, the village kept on developing. In 1903, they discovered higher ground near the village suitable for grazing and the village set up a communal sheep pasture. An official from the territorial government instructed them in building fences, supplying irrigation, and constructing livestock shelter. Next, prison labor was called in to lay a road along the river, and as time went on, flocks of sheep bought sheep from the government were being herded up the road. The farmer had not the slightest idea why the government was being so generous. Well, why not? They thought, after so hard a struggle, this was a welcome relief. Of course, the government was not being generous for nothing, giving them the ship, prodded by military's goal of self-sufficiency, in thermal wool for the upcoming campaign on the continent. The government had ordered Ministry of Agriculture and Business to increase efforts in ship raising, and the ministry had forced these plans on the territorial government. The Russo-Japanese war was drawing near. In all the villages, it was again the Ainu man, no longer a youth, who showed the greatest interest in ship. He learned the methods of ship raising from the territorial official and took on the responsibility of the village pasture. There is no knowing exactly why he became so devoted to ship. It may have been the complexities of life brought on by the village population, suddenly growing by leaps and bounds. The pasture became home to 36 head of South Downs and 21 head of Shropshires, in addition to two border collies. The Ainu man became an able shepherd, and with each passing year, the number of sheep and dogs increased. He came to love his sheep and his dogs with all his heart. The officials were more satisfied. Puppies were farmed out as top sheep dogs to similar sheep farms established nearby. When the Russo-Japanese war broke out, Five village youths were conscripted and sent to the front line in China. Two were killed and one lost his left arm when an enemy grenade exploded in a skirmish over a small hill. When the fighting ended three days later, the other two gathered up the scattered bones of their fellow village youths. All had been sons of first and second wave settlers. One of the dead was the eldest son of the Ainu youth turned shepherd. 
he died wearing an army issue wool overcoat why send boys off to war in a foreign land the ainu shepherd went around asking people by then he was 45 nobody would answer him the ainu shepherd broke off the village and stayed out at the pasture spending his waking and sleeping hours with the sheep his wife had died from bronchitis 5 years earlier and his two remaining daughters had both married for his services in mining the ship the village provided him with scant wages and food after losing his son the ainu shepherd grew embittered he died at age 62 one winter morning the boy who was his helper found him sprawled out dead on the floor of the ship house frozen two sorry eyed grand puppies of the original two border collies whined at his side The sheep, oblivious, were grazing away at the hay in their enclosure. The low, grinding rhythm of sheep teeth sounded like the chorus of castanets. The history of Junitaki went on, but history for the Ainu youth ended there. I got up to go to the John and piece two beers worth. When I returned to my seat, she was awake and gazing distractedly out of the window. Rice fields stretched far and wide. Occasionally, there'd be a silo. Rivers drew near. then re- retreated i smoked a cigarette taking in the scenery together with her profile taking in the scenery she spoke not a word once i finished my cigarette i went back to the book the shadow of a still breeze flashed across the page after the unhappy tale of the ainu youth who became a shepherd got old and died the remaining history was rather boring fare an outbreak of sheep bloat claimed 10 head severe cold dealt a temporary blow to crops But other than that everything went smoothly with the village in the Taisho era it was incorporated as a township and newly renamed Junitaki Cho Junitaki Cho did well building more facilities a primary school or town hall a postal service outpost by this time the settling of Hokkaido was nearly complete with arable land reaching its limit several young men left Junitaki Cho to seek their fortune in new worlds of Manchuria and Sakhalin In 1937 the ship professor made his appearance in the town read the history ministry of agriculture and forestry technical administrator much recognized for his studies in korea and manchuria doctor aged 32 took leave of his post due to special circumstances and established his own ship ranch in a mountain valley north of junitaki so nothing else about him was written the author himself seemed to have gotten bored by the events of the 30s on his reports became spotty and fragmentary even the writing style faltered losing the clarity of his discussion of the i knew youth i skipped the 31 years between 1938 and 1969 and jumped to this section titled junitaki today of course the books today being 1970 it was hardly today's today still writing the history of one town obviously imposed the necessity of bringing it up to or today and even if such a today soon ceases to be today no one can deny that it is in fact our today for if a today ceases to be today history could not exist as history according to my authoritative history of junitaki township in 1969 the population had dropped to 15000 or decrease of 6000 from 10 years prior due almost entirely to decline in farming the unusually high rate of agrarian disenfranchisement came about in reaction it stated to changes within the national infrastructure in a period of rapid industrial growth as well as to the peculiar nature of cold climate farming in hokkaido what became of their abandoned farmlands they were reforested the land that their forefathers had sweated blood clearing the descendants now planted with trees strains how that worked which was to say that the primary industry in junitaki today was forestry and lumber milling the town now boasted several small mills where they made television cabinets vanities and a tourist trade figurines of beers and ainus the former communal hunt was converted into the pioneer museum where the farming tools and eating utensils from early settlement days were kept on display there were no keepsakes of the village youths who had died in the russo japanese war also a lunch box bearing the teeth marks of a brown beer and even the letters to the old hometown inquiring about debt collectors but if the truth be known junitaki today was dreadfully dull town the town's folk when they came home from work watched an average of 4 hours of television before going to bed each night balloting ran high but it was never any surprise who won the election the town's slogan was bountiful humanity in bountiful nature or so the sign in front of the station read i closed the book yawned and fell asleep